This is an interview with George Clausen. Mr. Clausen was born on June 25, 1929 in Woodlake, California. Mr. Clausen served from June 15, 1951 until July 1, 1977 in the U.S. Air Force. Mr. Clausen achieved the rank of Colonel and this interview is taking place on December 4, 2014 at Da Vinci High School in Davis, California. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress as part of the Da Vinci High School's America War Project. Okay, so we're just going to dive into some background questions at first. Would you like to tell us maybe what your parents did or maybe if you had any siblings growing up? I, my father was born and raised in Denmark and came to the United States at the age of 15 by himself uh, and came through Ellis Island and eventually ended up in California where he met my mother who was born and raised in California and uh, they were married in 1919. I have one brother who was born in 1921 who's eight years older than me and uh, my dad was uh, basically associated with the orange business. He ran an irrigation district and also a packing house for packing oranges. Okay. Um, what did you do before entering the service? Uh, I was a student uh, and I just, in my fourth year at the University of California at Berkeley, did you have other family members that served at all? My brother served during World War II in the Navy from 1941 to, through 1945. How did you enter the service? Were you drafted or enlisted? I uh, enlisted but to the Aviation Cadet Program, in which I went through and was started in September. September of 1951 and graduated in 1952 and was commissioned uh, second lieutenant. And you, so you said you enlisted when why were the reasons for choosing the specific branch that you chose? Well I like to fly that's I had owned an airplane while I was in high school and I had been flying since the age of 16 so that seemed the only way to go, and I hate walking. <laughs> so what was the training like? Uh, for pilot training, mm -hmm. it was, uh, well, you get your military training, you know, up every morning, a few calisthenics, a little PT, running, breakfast, then go to school for eight hours, and come back, and you had a little bit of free time, all your meals are served in the mess hall while you're a cadet. It's a, you're a very regimented life, but helps me in my older age to keep me going straight. So did you have any specialized training? Uh, well, we each airplane that you flew, you had specialized training to check out and learn how to operate that airplane, become combat ready in it. Uh, that I do have schools. I went through the squadron officer's school, the armed forces staff college, which is the intermediate school, and then I graduated from the Air War College in 1971. And so how was adapting to the physical regimen as well as the food and the social life of being there? Well, from having grown up during the Depression era, and I'm speaking of the Great Depression because you've had many depressions since 1929. We're just su surviving one now. Uh, it was, wasn't was any, any problems. In fact, I sort of enjoyed it because you, you, know, you know what you're going to do most every minute of the day. You didn't have time to get in trouble like you do now. Was it easy to adapt or was it hard? It was easy. Easy? Uh, did you learn about all airplanes um, when you went through the specific training that you went through? Well, you learn about each different airplane. And I flew several 
models. All of my flying time basically is in fighter aircraft. And I started out in the days of the F-80, which was the first jet aircraft that the U.S. Air Force owned. And then I flew the straight wing F-84, the F-86, the F-100, the F-105, and the F-111. So, and, and I have about 8,000 flying hours total. And so it was easy adapting in physical regimen. What was the other things like, like social life and food, things like that? Well, when you're a cadet, you don't have a social life. Uh, then after you graduate your commission, then you, you know, it's, uh, depends on where you're at, uh, you know, what there is to do. Overseas, I went overseas to France in 1953, uh, and that was an experience, uh, living in a foreign country and not speaking French. I could speak some German because I'd taken that in college, uh, but that, uh, you know, it was... Why did you go to France? Because that's where I was assigned to that's the 48th Fighter Bomber Wing. And so what was your preferred aircraft? Oh, probably the F-105. That's the one I flew my 100 missions over North Vietnam in. So what were the emotions <coughs> relating to combat, you know, witnessing casualties and a lot of destruction? Well, it's probably very hard to put something like that into words that would be understandable. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, one out of three of the pilots I was with in Thailand was either shot down and captured and spent seven years in the Hanoi Hilton, or he was killed, or he's still missing and we haven't uh, found the remains as yet. So it, it is, it's somewhat stressful, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And but so did you form any good friendships, and what was the camaraderie of the service like? Oh, yes. In fact, I still, uh, for those that are still alive, I still communicate with people that I have known since I first went in the service. Mm -hmm. Were there any specific relationships? with people that you created? Well, yes, friends, you know, you write, we have reunions now that we go to see people, to visit. Um, we write generally Christmas cards every year, uh, still stay in contact. So probably much more so than you do in, in civilian life. Military gets to be a close-knit community and you take care of each other and so and you those friendships last forever so you mentioned reunions what are those like now when you well, see them after so long well nowadays when you go you're lucky you know that you're still ambulatory and can walk and and get around and have a good time although i should have brought the picture to show you that i've one I just attended in uh, December of this year in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, uh, which was for the 34th TAC Fighter Squadron, which was our squadron in Thailand. And I was very fortunate to be the commander of that squadron uh, while I was over there. And uh, it, it's, you know, you just sit around, you tell war stories, so how did you have a beer or two, you know. <laughs> how did you stay in touch with your family and friends that were back home? Was communication hard? Uh, well, the first time it was extremely hard because there was no way of communicating except by writing a letter through the U.S. mail. And so, you know, and that took days because it goes through the Army postal system and have to get back to the states and be delivered. So it, it was difficult. Uh, 
during the Vietnam War, which when I was in Thailand in 1967, uh, I bought two tape recorders, small ones, and I sent one back to my family who was staying in Las Vegas, Nevada while I was gone. And I kept one. And what I'd do is I'd sit down and I'd just make a tape and I'd talk like I was talking to you to ask, you know, how you're doing, what's going on, how's school going with, I have four children, so how school was going with them. And ask my wife how she was doing and maintaining order at home and so forth. So that was the only way. Nowadays, with the internet and so forth, you know, you can, you can talk back and forth daily and it's real time. You can see each other and uh, with the Skype or so forth. So it, it's entirely different. And telephone communication then was in, in out of the country. You could talk here in the United States, but from foreign countries it would be very difficult to even communicate with somebody. And so did you write a lot of letters back? Was it a common thing to get letters? Or was it more of a, a gift when they came? Was it like a once a week thing? Oh, it's generally it's whenever I got a letter, I responded back and it was probably the same thing. But the it was probably a week in transit uh, getting from like Thailand to the United States or Europe to the United States. And was the mail system fairly reliable? Probably more reliable then than it is today. Mm -hmm. And so what were your reaction or off-duty pursuits? My, I'm sorry, off-duty? <laughs> we can ignore that one. Oh. And so where were you when the Korean War ended specifically? I was in Europe. And then where were you when the Vietnam War ended? I was in uh, USAFE headquarters, U.S. Air Forces Europe. I was, at that time, I was director of fighter and reconnaissance operations for Air Forces Europe. Um, how did you return home? Uh, you mean when I retired or? Yeah. Or when I retired was my family, we were all living together and we drove from South Carolina to California, visiting a few people along the way. And what was your reception by family and community? Well, of course, my family, my wife, children, we were, we were together. Mm -hmm. uh, and my parents were both deceased when I returned, so. But I had a hard time when I went downtown to the little town where I was raised has, well, it's grown now, it has 6,000 population. It probably had 5,000 when I retired. And it was a hard thing trying to find somebody you knew. All the old merchants that owned the stores and things that were there uh, were deceased. And so you had to find, few of the old timers were still there. Uh, so it was, um, you know, took a little while to get used to meeting new people and people to get back reacquainted again. And was it hard to readjust to civilian life and being back home again? No. Not at all? No. What was one thing that you, miss the most other than your family while serving? Was there like food or was it just being in your own bed? Oh, well, yeah, you missed, uh, you don't get home cooking when you're mm -hmm. out there in the war zone, in fact, and around, but uh, you missed that. You missed, uh, you know, the love you received from your family and so forth. Those being separated, those are the... Um, and how did your wartime experiences affect you? 
Uh, well, I'm not sure they really affected me, to be truthful with you, but uh, you might ought to ask somebody else that, uh, <laughs> that I lived with or so forth. I thought I was fairly normal when I returned as far as that. I had, even though we were, every mission I went on over North Vietnam, you know, you're shot at every day. You know, it's, you flying along, you look down at the ground and you see this puffs of smoke coming up out of a semicircle down there. And depending on the color, you knew whether it was 57 millimeter, 85 millimeter, or 100 millimeter guns that are firing at you. And, uh, you know, they know they, they're fired and they're aimed in your direction and you just say a very quick prayer to God that they don't hit you. So we're having a quick battery issue, so we're just All right. Gonna... And so has your perspective on war changed before versus now? Well, it depends on which war you're, you're talking about. Uh, the the problems that we had, particularly during flying over North Vietnam, was rules of engagement. In other words, what you could strike and what you couldn't strike. And you were, we were extremely limited. We could find a lucrative target, but we couldn't strike it because that was orders from the President and the Secretary of Defense. So it, it's like fighting a war with your hands tied behind you. It's not that easy. Uh, but the Vietnam War, contrary to what most people would probably believe from reading in media, the newspaper, or what you've heard on TV or so forth, was actually a just war. There was a just reason for the war in Vietnam because you're trying to fight for people that were being oppressed that had no way and they needed help and we were there really to help them. Uh, so, and, but wars are not fun and they're not, and contrary to what many people think that uh, people in the military are just gung-ho to go fight a war and that's not the case. You're trained, that's what you're trained to do. But, uh, you know, you don't, that's not the way it is. People, they're going to fight and they'll carry out the orders. The president is the commander in chief and you have to do what he directs you to do, whether it's, whether you think it's right or not. And so, what do you think it was like for your family while you were serving? Well, it was difficult for them. Mm -hmm. For one thing, my wife had to take care of doing the things that I would normally do if I was there. And that made it difficult. She had to take care of the entire family. She has to look out for them. She doesn't have much time left, to, you know, to do social, she has a social life uh, with other women and one of the reasons I left my wife and things in Las Vegas when I left is there were several other wives that were there with their husbands in Southeast Asia the same as I was and that knew each other. So you had uh, a shoulder to lean on when you needed help. And, but it, it's very difficult. The family is the main part of the military, of, in the military. The wife is one of the main parts that keeps things going. They should get more credit mm -hmm. than they do for. And what was one of the most memorable missions that you went on? Oh, probably over there, one of the most memorable ones was when we went on a target that was in the buffer zone. We were just about 10 or 12 miles from the Chinese border. 
and every all of the supplies came down either the Northeast or the Northwest Railroad into Hanoi from China, with the exception of what the Russians brought into the harbor at Haiphong. And basically the Russians, they supplied all of the surface air missiles that were shooting at us and the training to the Vietnamese on how to use them. And a lot of the anti-aircraft ammunition so forth. Russia and China were the two suppliers for Vietnam in the uh, war. And our missions, as I told you, what we did was operation called Rolling Thunder. And that's the air war over North Vietnam. And our particular missions up there were to actually interdict targets and destroy them before they could get the supplies and bring them down the Ho Chi Minh Trail into South Vietnam for the Viet Cong and so forth to fight the Vietnam uh, Vietnamese army down there. So we were, our targets were basically uh, trying to destroy bridges or lines of communication, disrupt them from getting down there, to try to find any caches of munitions or so forth and destroy them. And that goes back now to when I said the, one of the missions that I thought we did the most good on was this one was up at Long Son in near the Chinese border. And they didn't think that we would go up and surprisingly JCS, uh, that's the Joint Chief of Staff who runs all of the military, that uh, allowed us to hit that. And we had uh, rail cars up there and uh, the day I went uh, up there and the flight I was leading, I was, that day I was going to be the flak suppression flight and we dropped cluster bomb units. And they're a bomb that looks like a, and it opens up like a clamshell. And it drops all of these little, about pound and a half, two pound bomblets out. And when they hit, they just explode and they blow shrapnel all over everything. And, but we hit a couple of rail cars and started fires going. And so it was a good mission. That's, and then one of the others was of course going on the, against the Paul Doomer Bridge which is the bridge that separates over the Red River that separates Hanoi from the uh, north. And uh, that was memorable in the fact that I lost my wingman on that, was shot down by a, with a SAM missile. And uh, just before we're ready to roll in on the target. And uh, that you know, was unfortunately this person that was shot down was the senior ranking prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. It was Colonel John Flynn. He was a very good friend of mine. I'd worked with him, for him in uh, Europe at Spangdalem Air Base prior to coming over there. He was our vice wing commander. So that's the day, that's when you're losing people, you know, and he's only 400 feet off my right wing sitting out there when the missile hit him. I heard the missile go by my aircraft, but it exploded next to him and not under me. Those are types of things, you know, that you'll remember and you'll never forget. And so what was your unit normally responsible for during, during the war? The 34th TAC Fighter Squadron was just one of the squadrons that supported the 388th Wing and on our missions in, of interdiction in North Vietnam. We flew no missions in South Vietnam. Every mission we flew was over North Vietnam, and I had some 35 missions over Hanoi itself. Were there a lot of soldiers who didn't want to fight in the war? 
none of the, the pilot. There were probably ground soldiers and so forth, and they were drafted and for two years or more in the military. There are probably some of them that you know wondered what how they got sent over there or why. Uh, most of us that were pilots, you know, that's what we were trained to do, and I won't say you, you know it scares you a little bit when you're getting shot at every day and only one out of three is not coming back. Uh, that can pry on your mind a little bit towards the end. Probably more at the beginning. Because they had the saying, you know, there ain't no way that you'll ever finish. Did anybody you know get punished for disregarding orders? Not that I know, no. And was there anybody you met during the war that changed you or really made an impression on you? Uh, one of the people that I was very impressed with was our wing commander when I went over to Karat. He'd also been my wing commander at Spang Dalam before we went over. At this time, all of us that were in Europe, because they didn't have enough F-105 pilots, were all moved from Europe or sent as you rotated over to the Vietnam War. So you knew each other from a previous assignment. But General Cherisel was, to me, was an outstanding commander. He looked after the people. Uh, you would think he'd, you know, you'd have to sleep sometime. You'd think he'd be in bed at night. He's down on the flight line checking to see if people have what they need in order to get the airplanes ready. Do you have the wherewithal to do what you need? If not, he's back talking to the, 7th Air Force and the commander's up the chain to tell him, listen, we've got to have this. He was a real people person. And uh, having worked for him before, he's probably the reason that I became a squadron commander. So can you tell us about a time that your plane ever came close to being hit or maybe even got hit? Well, as I told you, the missile that went by me that hit my number two man that's 400 feet off my right wing, that's fairly close. Although fortunately I was never hit, but there were, we, we lost, oh, we built 800 and some odd F-105s and 400 of them I think were lost in the war. Did About 50% was lost. Did you learn any life lessons from the military service? Did I learn any lessons? Life lessons, yeah. Life? Life lessons. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by life lessons. Uh, Did it teach you anything in general other than just strategic ways to fight or well, fly? probably taught me one thing, that uh, spiritually I became more involved, that uh, there is a God and He does wonderful things for you. And as long as you believe in Him, He'll get you through. And that's what General John Flynn told me, as, a, as who spent over six and a half years as a prisoner of war that the only prisoners that could handle being a POW were those people who had a strong spiritual belief and a belief in God. If you set your priorities, whether that your girlfriend or your sports car or so forth is your main priority, you're lost. You can't handle it. You have to have something to believe in that will get you through the situation. And I realize that they don't like you to probably speak about that in schools or so forth anymore, but it's the truth. Is 
there ever an apparent shortage of resources for you? Say again? Was there ever an apparent shortage of resources? Uh, probably not for us during the, in the war because you got every, if any of the resources that uh, people back home or some other unit needed, we got them to f keep our airplanes uh, flying and so forth. So there was probably a, a, a shortage, but it wouldn't show up in the combat unit because you get first priority. Were you ever involved in any aerial dog fights? Uh, no, I did see a few MiGs now and then, but they were way off in the distance and not. But I have uh, two people in the squadron that shot down a MiG. And so going back to the life lessons that you learned, was there ever a time when you lost faith? No. Never? No. If you lost faith, you've lost. And what exactly is an MIG? MIG? Yeah. That's uh, a aircraft. And the MIG, it's Russian. It means it's built by McCoyan. And that's where the name comes from uh, as a MIG. And they're designated by numbers. Uh, 15 was the first MiG that was built. That's the one that uh, they flew in Korea. And uh, that's where the F-86 was our f main fighter then that fought uh, the air battle in Korea uh, with uh, MiG-15 and the F-86, basically. And what were you doing in Europe when you were away from combat? In Europe, I was assigned to a wing over the 48th wing, and I was in Europe twice uh, on separate tours. And we were developing a nuclear weapons capability even for the F-86 uh, to carry a small uh, nuclear weapon. And then when I was in Europe uh, in 63 to 66 before going to Southeast Asia, and I was flying the F-105 over there, we set nuclear alert. We had uh, airplanes loaded with nuclear weapons. We were kept behind an enclosed, fenced-in area. You went in there, generally spent two days at a time uh, setting alert. So. And so going back to the wartime service, can you give us some details of the trip abroad? So what was it like? getting there and what was it like just interacting for the first few uh, years? When I, I left out of Travis over here uh, and flew directly to uh, Clark Air Force, well you landed in Alaska to refuel, but uh, landed at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines and I went through a jungle survival school th there and that lasted about two weeks. And then I went from uh, Clark over to Thailand. And then you, you know, you're assigned a squadron and I knew where I was going. So you get there and you get, they take you on an easy mission, the first one or two to get you briefed and drop a few bombs on some obscure target out there and <coughs> excuse me and then uh, after about the fifth mission why then we're heading north into North Vietnam we were in North Vietnam flying out of there but we're in they're set up by route packs over there there's one through six and six being the Hanoi Haiphong area. Route Pack 1 is next to the demilitarized zone and the border between South and North Vietnam. And so generally, first couple of three missions are targets in Route Pack 1, which does not have, they have AAA, AAA meaning anti-aircraft 
artillery uh, down there, but they don't have, they didn't have SAM missiles or heavier aircraft that they had in the north. So you, that, probably get a refueling mission or so, because I hadn't refueled, uh, air refueled in an airplane uh, for oh, probably a year before I got over there. So you get one, because every f mission going north, you take off, join up on a tanker as a flight of four, and you refuel, and then you drop off in formation and head north. Um, what were your first thoughts when you first saw combat? Well, the first time it, I thought there was not much to this, you know, he just went over and had a forward air controller that pointed out a target for you to hit and you dropped your bombs or your ordnance, whatever you were carrying, rockets or what, on the target and then come back home. So, till you start going north in the Hanoi area, then those are a lot of these are two ship flights. Some are four ship. Uh, you generally all of our missions, you always fly as a flight of in a fighter aircraft. You always fly as a flight of four. Now going north uh, up there, we had a, a twenty ship formation, so you had five flights of four aircraft going north. And so you're all out there and you've got these tankers, they're all set in one in trail behind each other and you got four 105s setting on each tanker and you rotate through uh, all four of you, the refuel, you know, you, you pull up and uh, you get two the echelon will be two on one side, one wing of the tanker, two on the other wing. And so you pull in and behind the tanker and refuel as you pull off, one from the other side pulls in when he pulls off. And the third man slides in behind and refuels. When he pulls off, the fourth man comes over and refuels. And we're probably in formation for 20 or 30 minutes up there. And just about five to ten minutes before we're going to drop off the tanker, we'll cycle through again and and refuel so we got a full fuel load to start with. Then you just drop off and you're heading north. So did you ever see nuclear weapons in combat? No. The only nuclear weapons that have ever been used was and they weren't nuclear, they were atomic weapons. And they were dropped on uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Japan at the end of, that stopped World War II. And so what did the supplies in the cockpit consist of just in case a plane were to be shot down? Supplies? Yeah. There are none in the cockpit. You're wearing them. You wear a survival vest. What's on the vest? Oh, uh, let's see. You got water. You've got food. I've, it's not in the vest. It's strapped on. I've got a 38 uh, caliber revolver. Got ammunition for that. You've got a blood shit. Uh, you know that's uh, little flag-like things. To, and you can turn in if you're caught as a POW. Didn't mean a thing during the war over there, but you've got, it's basic things that you need to survive with. Was it stressful landing on the tankers? You mean refueling? Yeah. Yeah, you don't land on them. You, they, they've got a probe out the back and you just pull up and he stabs that right into your receptacle on the airplane and they pumped fuel into you. And what did your training say to do if you're crash landed behind enemy lines? Well, the first thing you, 
you try to do, of course, is to you want to escape and evade being captured. That's what you're taught. Up there, if you're shot down and over the middle of downtown Hanoi, there's not much chance of ever escaping because they're waiting. They're probably somebody shooting at you in a rifle as you're floating down in your parachute. But they, you barely hit the ground till you're captured. So did you have any experiences involving the Agent Orange herbicide? No, no, that was only used to defoliate in South Vietnam. I spent a little over 26 years in the, in the service and I wasn't married the first three years. I met my wife in uh, Phoenix, Arizona and she worked for American Airlines. She was from Buffalo, New York. And if you read the newspaper here about two weeks ago and saw how much snow Buffalo got, you know why she wanted to move from Buffalo to the west. Because uh, it was horrible going to the airport and trying to come home at 2 o'clock in the morning when your car battery is dead and it's so cold that it wouldn't turn over anyway. And snow and so forth. So. But I, so I, we met in, when I was at Williams Air Force Base, which is at Chandler, right outside of Phoenix. And uh, we were married, and I was there four years. And uh, my two oldest children were born in Mesa, Arizona and my two youngest were born at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, Las Vegas. And Nancy over there is my third daughter, so she was born in Nevada. And so um, after retirement from the Air Force, what did you do? Well, I went back and I had an orange grove that was in my family that my grandfather had set out and it comes through, so I took that over and also I was a soil science major in uh, college so I taught 10 years at College of Sequoias at junior college level and so I taught soils and fertilizer, I taught a citrus class, I taught an economic entomology class, uh, a fertilizers class. I could teach either plant science or soils. I could and so I know you already told me specifically, but did, if you would like to repeat what merits you received for your service, or any oh. medals? Oh, I received two silver stars, uh, two legions of merit, two, three distinguished flying crosses, 16 air medals, and other numerous accommodation medals. Any last? Thing you would like to mention, story maybe? Oh, it was always, I really enjoyed flying. That's probably, the, that's the reason I went in the Air Force is I enjoyed flying. And I'd do it again today if I could, although I'm not too sure I could serve today under the present regime. Uh, I'll drop that right there. Uh, okay.